there is a lot of reaction to the simultaneous raids on homes in Florida and California linked to music mogul Sean Diddy Combs. There's no doubt that Diddy is about to lose it all. At the same time the raids were taking place, Combs was spotted pacing at an airport. I mean, it looks bad. I mean, social media is having a field day. They're calling him the diddler. Canceled, officially, done. Yeah, I think it's over. But hold up, let's not start counting our eggs before they hatch. There have been countless times we thought this dude was done for, only for him to wiggle out like a pesky cat with nine lives. Days of deliberations, the jury now appears to be focusing on the gun possession and bribery charges against Sean Puffy Combs. Hip-hop music mogul Sean Diddy Combs spent tonight in handcuffs. He's accused of assaulting one of his son's football coaches at UCLA. A lot of people believe that similar to his past cases, where outcomes resulted in either a pat on the back or no consequence at all, the new allegations against Diddy will likely follow suit. In this video, I will take you through Diddy's criminal history and how he was able to wave it all away with an apology or snitching on someone. Diddy plea deal. In the late 1990s, the music industry was buzzing with anticipation for the release of rapper Nas' highly anticipated music video for his hit song, Hate Me Now. Little did anyone know that this video would become the catalyst for a series of events that would rock the world of hip hop and tarnish the reputation of one of its biggest stars. The video, which premiered on MTV, featured a provocative scene that would ignite a firestorm of controversy. In the initial version, Sean Puffy Combs, also known as Puff Daddy, made a cameo appearance, but it was his portrayal that caused an uproar. Combs was shown hanging from a cross a powerful and religiously charged image that deeply offended him due to his strong religious beliefs. As the video made its debut, Combs was incensed by the inclusion of the scene. He felt that it was a direct attack on his faith and a disrespectful portrayal. The tension between Combs and Steve Stout, the president of Interscope Records' Urban Music Division and a consultant to Nas, began to escalate rapidly. On that fateful day, Combs stormed into Stout's New York office, fueled by anger and a desire to confront him about the video. The situation quickly spiraled out of control, leading to a physical altercation between Combs and Stout. Witnesses reported that Combs used a chair, a telephone, and even a champagne bottle as weapons during the assault. The incident sent shockwaves through the music industry, leaving fans and critics stunned. The once glamorous and larger-than-life image of Puff Daddy was now marred by this violent outburst. The controversy surrounding the video and the subsequent altercation would forever change the trajectory of Combs' career. After the highly publicized altercation between Puff Daddy and Steve Stout, the legal system swiftly took action. Sean Combs found himself facing serious charges that could have resulted in a lengthy prison sentence. People thought it was over for him then. How could he come back from this? It was impossible. However, as the case progressed, a series of plea bargaining negotiations began to unfold. For seven weeks, Combs and his lawyer, Harvey Slovis, engaged in intense discussions with the prosecution. The goal was to reach a resolution that would lessen the severity of the charges and potentially spare Combs from a lengthy prison term. Finally, after weeks of negotiations, a breakthrough was reached. On that fateful day in court, Combs stood before Manhattan criminal court judge Martin Murphy. The judge, well aware of Combs' history and the gravity of the charges, addressed him with a mix of sternness and caution. Judge Murphy remarked, You have a very interesting history. Let's hope we never meet again. These words served as a stark reminder of the previous case that Murphy had presided over, involving a stampede at a charity basketball game organized by Combs and rapper Heavy D, which tragically claimed the lives of nine people. With the weight of his past and the current charges hanging over him, Combs made the difficult decision to plead guilty to a reduced charge of harassment. This plea marked a significant turning point in in the case, as it meant that Combs would avoid the possibility of a lengthy prison sentence. Instead, he would be required to participate in a one-day anger management program, after which the charge would be wiped from his record. Combs' bodyguard, Paul Offord, also pleaded guilty to the reduced charge, further solidifying the resolution of the case. The plea agreement offered a glimmer of hope for Combs, who was eager to put the incident behind him and move forward with his career. As the courtroom drama unfolded, the world watched in anticipation, wondering how the legal battle would ultimately conclude. The reduced charge and the plea bargaining process shed light on the prosecutor's perspective, suggesting that they did not view the incident as a serious crime. However, Combs' lawyer, Slovis, acknowledged that his client should not have lost his temper, emphasizing the need for anger management. With the guilty plea entered and the legal battle coming to a close, Puff Daddy, now burdened with the weight of his actions, sought to move forward and put the incident behind him. As he walked out of the courtroom, Combs remained tight-lipped, refusing to engage with reporters hungry for a statement. His lawyer, Harvey Slovis, spoke on his behalf, stating that Combs 
Combs wanted to move on from the ordeal and focus on the future. Slovis emphasized that Combs deeply regretted his actions and the impact they had on his life and career. The reduced charge served as a reminder that the prosecutors did not view the incident as a serious crime, but rather as a result of Combs losing his temper. However, despite Diddy's record being expunged through one anger management class, his temperament remained volatile, revealing a narrative entrenched in a troubling history of violence. Diddy's History of Violence Diddy's journey has been marked by both incredible success and a series of violent incidents that have captured headlines over the years. From tragic stampedes to assault charges and high-profile trials, Diddy's violent history is a captivating tale that sheds light on the darker side of fame and fortune. The event you don't want to miss. Featuring appearances by some of your faves like Heavy D, members of Run DMC, Jodeci, Boys to Men, and more. In the early 1990s, Sean Combs, then a relatively unknown 22-year-old radio station intern, found himself thrust into the spotlight when he co-hosted a celebrity basketball game alongside rapper Heavy D. The event took place at the City College of New York Gymnasium, and little did anyone know that it would turn into a tragedy that would haunt Diddy for years to come. The gymnasium was jam-packed with eager fans, all excited to catch a glimpse of their favorite celebrities. However, what was meant to be a night of entertainment and fun quickly turned into a nightmare. As the game progressed, the crowd grew increasingly restless and the atmosphere became tense. A few times I thought I was going to pass out because it was hot on that staircase, you know what I'm saying? And when they closed the doors, I knew something was going down. City College was a deep, deep, deep experience for me. I was there, I was on the floor, I watched people take their last breath regurgitating. Suddenly, chaos erupted within the overcrowded gymnasium. A stampede broke out, causing panic and confusion among the attendees. In the midst of the chaos, nine people tragically lost their lives and many others were injured. It was a devastating turn of events that would forever be etched in the memories of those who were present that fateful night. In the aftermath of the stampede, an investigation was launched to determine the cause of the tragedy. A report commissioned by Mayor David N. Dinkins shed light on the events leading up to the stampede and placed some of the blame on Sean Cole himself. The report criticized Diddy for allowing inexperienced individuals to plan the event and for misleading ticket buyers about its charitable intention. Diddy, in response to the tragedy, expressed his deep remorse and sorrow. He acknowledged the pain and loss experienced by the families affected by the stampede, stating, City College is something I deal with every day of my life, but the things that I deal with can in no way measure up to the pain that the families deal with. I just pray for the families and pray for the children who lost their lives every day. On the flip side, folks were quick to clock the flaws in his story. Somebody spilled that they peeped him and a woman we now know as Jessica Rosenblum bouncing from the ticket booth around 7 p.m. with Puff clutching them big white money bags. While the tragic stampede at the celebrity basketball game was a dark chapter in Diddy's history, it also could have served as a catalyst for change, but it did not. After the tragic stampede at the celebrity basketball game, Sean Combs, now known as Diddy, channeled his energy into his music career. In 1992, he secured an internship at Uptown Records, where he quickly made a name for himself with his production skills. Diddy's talent and hard work paid off when he worked on the remix of Judici's hit single, Come and Talk to Me. The remix became a massive success, selling a staggering 3 million copies and solidifying Diddy's reputation as a rising talent in the music industry. His success continued to grow as he collaborated with other artists, including Heavy D and the reggae sensation Supercat. However, it was his work on Mary J. Blige's album, My Life, that garnered him his first Grammy nomination for Best R&B Album. Diddy's production skills were in high demand, and he was quickly becoming a force to be reckoned with. In 1993, Diddy faced a significant setback when he was terminated from Uptown Records. However, this setback only fueled his determination to succeed. He founded his own record label, Bad Boy Records, and set out to make his mark on the music industry. Bad Boy Records quickly gained attention with the release of the Notorious Big's debut album, Ready to Die, in 1994. The album received critical acclaim for its raw portrayal of the realities of street life and the struggles faced by young black men. It peaked at number 15 on the Billboard 200 and spawned hit records like Juicy, One more chance and Big Papa. To date, the album has been certified six times platinum. While Diddy's success in the music industry was undeniable, his journey was not without its share of controversy and violent incidents. In 1999, Diddy found himself at the center of a highly publicized altercation with record producer Steve Stout. The dispute arose over the use of footage in a music video, and tensions escalated quickly. Stout claimed that Diddy and his bodyguards assaulted him, using a champagne bottle, a telephone, a chair, and their fists as weapons. The charges of felony assault could have resulted in up to 
to seven years in prison for Diddy. However, Stout eventually asked the Manhattan District Attorney to drop the charges after Diddy issued a public apology. Later that same year, Diddy's involvement in another violent incident made headlines. While spending a night out at a Manhattan nightclub with his then-girlfriend, actress and singer Jennifer Lopez, an argument broke out, leading to gunfire. At least two people were injured, and the details of the interaction remained muddled throughout the highly publicized trial. Diddy was charged with gun possession and bribery, but was ultimately found not guilty. However, his one-time protege, rapper Shine, received a 10-year prison sentence for his involvement in the incident. These violent incidents cast a shadow over Diddy's rising success in the music industry. While his talent and business acumen were undeniable, the controversies surrounding him raised questions about his personal conduct and the company he kept. It was a tumultuous time for Diddy as he navigated the highs and lows of fame, fortune, and the consequences of his actions. In 2002, Diddy ventured into the world of reality television with MTV's Making the Band. The show aimed to assemble talented individuals into performing groups, and Diddy took on the role of a demanding boss, pushing the contestants to their limits. This marked a new chapter in Diddy's career as he showcased his entrepreneurial spirit and his ability to mold aspiring artists into stars, the band and Danny D. Kane. However, as the show progressed, cracks began to show in Diddy's image as a mentor and boss. Former band members started speaking out against what they described as mistreatment and unfair contracts. One member of the band, Freddie P, even took to Instagram to express his disdain for Diddy, stating that he hates life because of him. These revelations shed light on the darker side of Diddy's management style and raise questions about his treatment of aspiring artists. Amidst the controversies surrounding making the band, Diddy made a significant business move in 2003. His label, Bad Boy Records, terminated its joint venture with Arista, leaving Diddy with full ownership of the label and its back catalog. This decision solidified Diddy's position as the driving force behind Bad Boy Records and its roster of talented artists. While Diddy's focus shifted towards business ventures, his music career continued to thrive. In the same year, he achieved another number one hit on the Billboard 100 with the single Shake Your Tail Feather from the Bad Boys 2 soundtrack. The song, performed by Nelly Murphy Lee and P. Diddy, showcased Diddy's versatility as an artist and earned him his second Grammy Award for Best Rap Performance by a duo or group. However, as Diddy's empire expanded, so did the controversies surrounding him. Critics accused him of prioritizing his business interests over the well-being of his artists. The mistreatment and unfair contracts alleged by former band members of DeBan and Danity Kane raised concerns about the ethics of Diddy's management practices. In 2013, Diddy faced yet another legal dispute, this time involving his clothing brand, Sean John. A former employee filed a lawsuit against Diddy, claiming that he had been subjected to a hostile work environment and wrongful termination. The case highlighted the potential dark side of Diddy's business ventures and the allegations of misconduct within his empire. Despite the controversies, Diddy's business acumen remained undeniable. He expanded his empire beyond the music industry, earning recognition as a top menswear designer for his Sean John clothing brand. In 2009, he forged a partnership with Diageo to release C-Rock Vodka, a move that further solidified his status as a successful entrepreneur. Diddy's business ventures, combined with his music career, contributed to his estimated net worth of $1 billion, according to Forbes. As Diddy's career progressed into the later years, he continued to make headlines both for his business ventures and the controversies that seemed to follow him. Despite his success, he found himself embroiled in ongoing legal disputes and allegations of misconduct. In 2015, Diddy faced yet another arrest, this time on assault charges. The incident occurred during an altercation with a UCLA football coach. The university described the weapon involved as a kettlebell. The Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office decided against pursuing felony charges, and the details surrounding the incident remain somewhat unclear. Hip-hop music mogul Sean Diddy Combs spent tonight in handcuffs. He's accused of assaulting one of his son's football coaches at UCLA. Nevertheless, the incident added to the list of violent encounters that have marked Diddy's history. However, I have to speak up on this. Something just isn't adding up. We haven't even touched on his ties to Tupac's death. Despite his rap sheet dripping with violence and all the evidence stacking against him, he somehow slips through the cracks. Who's to say history won't repeat itself here? Diddy's home raided. There's a lot of reaction to the simultaneous raids on homes in Florida and California linked to music mogul Sean Diddy Combs. Hip-hop and liquor mogul Sean Diddy Combs finds himself at the center of a scandal as federal agents with Homeland Security investigations conducted raids at his homes in both Los Angeles and Miami. These raids were part of a federal sex trafficking investigation, and the agents seized a number of electronic devices as evidence. In Los Angeles, Diddy's sprawling mansion in the exclusive Homeby Hills neighborhood became the 
target of the federal agents. The mansion, known for its luxurious amenities and extravagant parties, was flooded with Homeland Security agents who meticulously searched every corner of the property. The agents, armed with court-authorized search warrants, were on a mission to gather evidence that could potentially support the allegations of sex trafficking against Diddy. Simultaneously in Miami, another team of Homeland Security agents descended upon Diddy's lavish residence. Located in one of the city's most affluent neighborhoods, the mansion stands as a symbol of Diddy's success in the music industry. However, on this fateful day, it became the backdrop for a high-stakes investigation. The agents combed through the property, meticulously examining every room and seizing any electronic devices that could potentially hold crucial evidence. The involvement of Homeland Security agents in these raids highlights the gravity of the allegations against Diddy. It signifies that the investigation goes beyond the realm of local law enforcement and has escalated to a federal level. The presence of these agents, known for their expertise in combating human trafficking, underscores the seriousness of the accusations and the determination of the authorities to uncover the truth. The seizure of electronic devices during the raids is a significant development in the investigation. These devices, including smartphones, laptops, and tablets, hold a wealth of information that could potentially shed light on the alleged sex trafficking activity. It is believed that Diddy may have used these devices to communicate with individuals involved in the illicit activities, capture evidence, or engage in other incriminating actions. The thoroughness with which the agents seized these devices indicates their commitment to leaving no stone unturned in their pursuit of justice. As the agents meticulously gathered evidence, the atmosphere at Diddy's homes was undoubtedly tense. The raids disrupted the otherwise glamorous and extravagant lifestyle associated with the music mogul. Diddy's sons, who happened to be present at his Los Angeles home during the raid, were detained by the agents. This precautionary measure is customary in such circumstances to ensure the safety of all parties involved. However, it is important to note that no criminal charges have been filed against Diddy or his family members at this stage of the investigation. Diddy's representation released a statement in response to the raids, expressing their outrage at what they deemed a gross overuse of military-level force. They criticized the excessive show of force and hostility exhibited by the authorities during the raids. The statement also highlighted the mistreatment of Diddy's children and employees, emphasizing that there was no excuse for such behavior. Despite media speculation, the statement clarified that neither Diddy nor any of his family members have been arrested, and their ability to travel has not been restricted in any way. His representation labeled the entire situation as a witch hunt based on meritless accusations made in civil lawsuits. They emphasized that there has been no finding of criminal or civil liability against Diddy in relation to these allegations. The statement concluded by asserting Diddy's innocence and his unwavering commitment to fighting to clear his name. The first lawsuit against Diddy was filed by singer Cassandra Cassie Ventura, Diddy's former girlfriend, in federal court in New York's Southern District. Ventura's lawsuit alleges that Diddy raped her, forced her into sex trafficking, and subjected her to years of abuse. However, just days after the lawsuit was filed, it was settled. Diddy's attorney emphasized that the settlement was not an admission of wrongdoing, but rather a mutual agreement between the parties involved. The attorney stated that Diddy's decision to settle does not undermine his denial of the claims and that he wishes Ventura the best. Following Ventura's lawsuit, Joy Dickerson Neal filed a suit in New York accusing Diddy of drugging and sexually assaulting her in 1991. Additionally, she claimed to be a victim of revenge porn by the music artist. These allegations paint a disturbing picture of Diddy's alleged actions. However, it is important to note that Diddy's attorney has denied these claims, labeling them as lies. The attorney stated that they have overwhelming and indisputable proof that the allegations made by Dickerson Neal are complete fabrications. In December, an anonymous woman referred to as Jane Doe filed a federal lawsuit accusing Diddy of sex trafficking and gang rape in 2003 when she was just 17 years old. These allegations, if proven true, would be deeply troubling and could have severe consequences for Diddy's reputation and legal standing. However, Diddy has formally denied these allegations in court filings. His attorney argued that the lawsuit should be dismissed due to the substantial passage of time, which has prejudiced Diddy's ability to defend himself fully and fairly. The attorney also raised concerns about the potential unavailability, loss, or compromise of evidence and the compromised recollections of witnesses due to the significant time that has elapsed. Adding to the list of accusers is Rodney Lil Rod Jones, a former employee of Diddy who filed a lawsuit accusing him of sexual assault and leading a criminal sex trafficking organization. Jones's claims include allegations of serious illegal activity captured in hours of footage and audio recordings. In an amended complaint filed in November, Liza Gardner accused Diddy and singer Aaron Hall of battery and sexual assault in 1990 when she was was just 16 years old. According to the lawsuit, Gardner and a friend met Diddy and Hall at an event where they were allegedly flirtatious and handsy. The suit 
claims that Diddy and Hall offered them drinks throughout the night, despite their underage status. Later, at Hall's apartment for an after party, Gardner alleges that she was physically forced into having sex with Diddy against her will. She further claims that Hall came into the room, pinned her down, and forced her to have sex. The next day, Diddy allegedly assaulted and choked Gardner to the point of her passing out. It is important to note that Aaron Hall has not publicly spoken about these allegations. In response to these allegations, Diddy released a statement in December, vehemently denying all the claims made against him. He expressed his frustration at the attempts to assassinate his character and destroy his reputation and legacy. Diddy labeled the allegations as sickening and made by individuals looking for a quick payday. He asserted his innocence and vowed to fight for his name, his family, and the truth. In the lawsuit filed by Cassandra Cassie Ventura, she claimed that Diddy used his electronic devices, including his phone, laptop, and tablet, to film their sexual interactions. This allegation suggests that Diddy may have documented his encounters with Ventura, potentially providing crucial evidence for the investigation. Similarly, Joy Dickerson Neal alleged that Diddy filmed her sexual assault and showed the video to others as revenge porn. These claims, if substantiated, could provide concrete proof of Diddy's involvement in illegal activities. That brings us to the end of this video. For more videos like this, click on the cards on your screen.